Welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday interview sessions. I am your host, Ryan Hartley. This channel exists to inspire and encourage your heart-centered leadership. Each week, I share interviews with some of the greatest heart-centered leaders in the world. I hope our time spent together helps you leave a heart print where those around you are left better than yesterday. Please visit abty.co.uk if you would like us in your corner. These interview sessions are brought to you by Matt Media Online Marketing, an independent agency who specialize in content marketing, helping business owners get their message seen by the right audience. If you want to get your business seen through the power of social media, head to mattmedia.online. On episode 233, I welcome back John Gordon to the podcast for a third time. John is the author of 28 books, including 15 bestsellers, five children's books, and the timeless classic, The Energy Bus, which has sold over 2 million copies. John is back today to talk about his new book, The One Truth, a book that will help you elevate your mind, unlock your power, and heal your soul. Here we go. It's episode 233 with our brother, John Gordon. John Gordon, for a third time, welcome back to the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast. How are you? Third time is a charm, Ryan. I'm so grateful to be back with you. Oh, so good to see you. And I just want to, I think man to man, I just want to honor you for what an incredible daughter you've raised. Since we've last spoke, I had Jade on the podcast. We had an incredible conversation. I just want to honor you as a father. And I know you're doing great, great work with, with Catherine to, to raise such wonderful children. I oh, appreciate that. Thanks for having her on. And I believe Catherine has been on as well. So you got to see Jade, how she's probably a combination, a little bit of both of us, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. She's, a, she's an incredible human being. Um, there's, a, there's a battle going on right now. There's a battle going on in the world. And, uh, and I think you might need to add an additional D to the garden. I think, so, I think the enemy is trying to de-voice you. I think the enemy is <laughs> trying to take away your voice because this one truth that you're sharing is, is powerful. And the only way the enemy can stop you is to take away your voice. That's so powerful the way you just said that, because yes, there's the truth. And if you can't share the truth, then you actually could then magnify the lies. And the more people believe the lies, they then actually don't get to know the truth or get to live the truth. So it really is a battle between lies and the truth. Will we believe the lies or will we know the truth? And we know the truth sets you free. So it's all about knowing the truth. I've uh, I've just finished reading the One Truth. I've been on vacation last week with my family, and um, I just get the sense while I'm reading it, your excitement for sharing it. Like you, you've written twenty plus books, fifteen bestsellers, and yet I can feel the excitement for this idea that you're sharing. Why is this different to anything else that you shared before? This is my twenty eighth book, mm. and I feel like I'm just getting started. I feel like with <laughs> this book. I'm just beginning. The other books were important. I loved writing the other books. Power of Positive Leadership, I believe, is the definition of leadership. Energy Bus Mm. put me on the map and has been read by millions of people. So I love Energy Bus. Carpenter, people say is probably my best book and training camp is my favorite. But the one truth is revolutionary. The one truth is so new. It's so fresh. It really is the key to life and how to go through life with more power, confidence, courage, peace, instead of living chronically worried, fearful, stressed, and honestly insecure, like so many people do right now. So it really, I believe, is the answer Mm -hmm. to the challenges people are facing. And it is the solution to the separation. We're feeling more and more separate. And that's why oneness and the one truth are so important. And so, yeah, I'm just excited about it. I love sharing it. I don't get tired of sharing it. I think this is my like, hundredth podcast in five days or something like that (laughs) and i've been talking more and more and more and i'll lose my voice by the end of the day i wake up the next morning do a little honey and i'm ready i'm ready to rock and roll so i just love talking about the concept and i know like i just know it's so helpful as people understand it you know right i'm hearing from people who have read it they're like wow this is your best book ever wow This is so new. Wow, I love what you said here with the five Ds. I love what you talked about in terms of tuning your brain. I love that you said the brain is an antenna. I love that you talked about how to overcome fear. Everyone 
has been talking about some of these things, but not in this way and not with such practicality, simplicity, but also from a profound standpoint of, of how it all works. Friends, thank you for being here so far. I just want to have a heart to heart moment with the men. Men, are you tired of going it alone? Do you want to connect with other men who have been there, who have gone before you? Then Akira is the group for you. We know that as men, we're supposed to have it all figured out. But the truth is, none of us have all the answers. Well, that's where Akira comes in. Our group of successful men is here to provide you with the support, guidance and advice that you need to achieve your goals. We don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. Our members have been through the ups and downs of life and we've come out the other side wiser and stronger. We want to share our knowledge and experience with you so that you can avoid the pitfalls and reach your potential. Akira is our brotherhood, a place where men can be vulnerable, share their struggles and celebrate their victories. We meet regularly to discuss the issues that matter most to us, from career, finances, relationships and personal growth. And we do it all in a safe and confidential environment. So if you're ready to level up in life and become the best version of you, the best version of you for yourself and those you lead, then consider joining Akira today. You can find out all the information that you need at abty.co.uk forward slash Akira. The link's in the show notes. We're waiting for you, brother. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that the Western civilization is characterized by is a disconnection from God. You know, there's... Mm. Um, we we have less faith than ever, and and I and I love this one phrase that says a a culture without God will make gods of their culture, and yet there are so many things just hidden in plain sight that we're not even aware of that, you know, are just causing us to separate from ourselves, from other people, from God, and and I and I love what you say in the book, which is about you know there's a there's a war being waged. But we don't really stand a chance if we don't realize that there's a war being waged and, and the methods with which the enemy work. Let's let's just start there briefly, fill us in with this idea of where, where the battle is being held. Yeah, there is a battle going on. It's the battle for our mind. It's the battle mm. for our thoughts. And I love what you just said in terms of if a world without God will make gods of our culture. Well, mm. in the oneness, right, you are aware of that you are connected to your creator. And there's so much power there. As you feel more and more separate, the gap between oneness and separateness, you now try to fill the gap. So if there's a disconnection between you and God, you're going to try to fill with all these other things that are often cheap substitutes, false idols, things that aren't God, but that you make your gods. And those things make you more and more miserable. Those things make you feel more and more separate, more and more anxious, the root for the Greek word of, of, of anxious means to separate and divide. And so the more anxious I am, the more separate and divided I feel. And the more you understand this, you can recognize, okay, how do I feel when I'm one and connected? I feel joy. I feel power. I feel peace and love and purpose and courage and confidence. I was talking to someone and they said, you know, I'm having all these issues. I'm feeling anxious. I'm worried. I'm stressed a lot. I said, I bet you feel really far from God. And this is a person who believes in God, but said, you know, I said, I bet you feel really far. They said, oh yeah, definitely. How'd you know? I said, because if you were connected, you wouldn't be feeling this way. Yeah. You would have a completely set, different set of emotions and feelings that you would be feeling. And so the battle is for our mind. The battle is for our soul. And there's a battle going on between this force that wants to divide and separate and weaken you and make you feel powerless. And the power, which is God, that wants to, share love and love you and unite you back to himself. And everything can be explained in terms of this once you understand it. And once you understand it, the world makes so much more sense. Mm. And so there's doubt, which is the first D. The second D is distortion, which are negative thoughts and lies that will tell you things about yourself and your future that just aren't true. And I always ask people, do your negative thoughts come from you? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, they're in my head. But here's the next question. If you believe your negative thoughts come from you, who would ever choose to have a negative thought? Mm -hmm. Would you ever choose a negative thought? No, you wouldn't choose a negative thought. So your negative thoughts are not coming from you. No one has ever found a thought inside of a brain. And I've talked to neuroscientists. And also when you're dreaming, having a nightmare, are you choosing those thoughts? No, you're not. 
So the thoughts are always coming in. And guess what? They lie to you. And they tell you things about yourself and your future that just aren't true. And that makes you feel weak. That makes you feel powerless. That discourages you, which is the third day. So once people understand these five Ds, they're like, wow, it makes too much sense not to be true, right? Because mm -hmm. it is the truth. So that third D is discouragement. We don't give up because it's hard. We give up because we get discouraged. The oh, fourth okay. D is distractions. And we're always distracted by social media, by the media, by so many things going on in this world that keep us from what matters most and keep us from our purpose and our destiny. And then there's that fifth D, which is division. And we just talked about the word anxious and meaning to separate and divide. And that's what negative thoughts do. That's what fear does. And to prove this, when you move from oneness to separateness, you move from positive to negative. And all mental health disorders yeah. report feelings of being alone and isolated and disconnected. And they feel what? Separate. And so think about that. The more I move towards mental dysfunction and away from mental health, I have these feelings of separateness. The more I move towards mental health and wholeness, I actually feel so much better and more positive mm -hmm. and more joyful. This is exactly what we're talking about. So there's proof yeah. that these Ds are, are coming after us and that are attacking us. Yeah. And if yeah. you didn't choose the negative thought yourself, if you didn't choose it yourself, then where would it come from? I had a young man ask me this recently who was suicidal when I was teaching this to him. And he said, well, where do negative thoughts come from then? I'm like, well, where do you think they're coming from? Why would there be a negative thought in the first place? People say, well, it's about survival. I mean, we had to run from the tiger. We had to survive in, in the wilderness and, and so forth. Yes, but when those negative thoughts come in, you know what they told you? Run, mm. go. They actually brought clarity. They didn't paralyze you with fear. They didn't cause you to question yourself. They no. actually led to your survival saying no or go, fight or flight, one or the other. That actually is actually the ultimate clarity that you could see what to do in those moments. Mm -hmm. Evolutionary thoughts don't explain the attack from our identity standpoint of I'm not enough. If I don't succeed, I'm worthless. I'm not worthy. I'm not going to be loved if I don't perform well. I'm tying my outcome and my performance to my identity. See, negative thoughts are attack on your identity. That's a spiritual game that you're playing when that happens. That's the journey of life. See, you are the hero in your own epic story. So we're all playing the hero in our own story. And as we move towards our journey, towards our destiny, we will face an adversary along the way. And that adversary will try to make us feel powerless like kryptonite. That's why every single movie resonates with people when it, in terms of the battle between good versus evil. And so we get this force that's always trying to weaken us and divide us and keep us from our destiny. And that's what those negative thoughts do. Once you realize this, stop beating yourself up. Stop feeling guilt and shame. You're not the cause of your own negative thoughts. You don't have the power of the first thought, but you have the power of the second thought and how you respond to the thoughts in your head that are trying to deceive you and distract you and ultimately destroy you. So once you recognize this, now you can move forward with power and the one truth to elevate your state of mind, to overcome the negative thoughts that lower your state of mind. And this is how you win the battle of your mind. Mm, I love that description. And, you know, I've been, I've been around your content for a very long time. And, you know, the the compounding effect of this one simple idea of talk to yourself, not listen to yourself. Like that's that's been straight in my heart and my mind, right? I've had that in there. And, and honestly, that compounds. That simple idea has compounded over time so that when those thoughts do come in, I'm not fearful of them. I, I can engage with them and I can sidestep them and I can speak truth to those lies. And I just love how all of your ideas have provided this platform for just because because what you're talking about is is a lens with which to see the world right and and once it's on it's not taken off like you you see light dark you see good evil you see positive negative it's a framework for everything you've talked about for the last 15 20 years which is wonderful um and, and i just think you've got a president at the moment or or a presidential candidate that is seeking to run on the basis of truth. Do you think he can do it? Do you think that Who, someone who's can... that? So that's Robert Kennedy Jr. 
So he's seeking to run his his presidential campaign based on the truth, exposing truth. Do you think our culture is ready for that? Do you think it's possible to be in such a high prolific uh, position and, and run on the truth? I think our culture needs that. Right, I yeah. think our culture wants that. You always thrive with the truth. It's mm -hmm. the lies that deceive you and to cause you to be less than. The truth always calls you to more. The truth always calls you to be more. And it's so funny. I was at a recent event that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was at. And I actually asked them at the event, they were taking questions. And I said, what are your core values? Because every leader of every organization must know and have core values that you rally people around. What are the core values of the United States of America? What are your core values? And how will you move us towards those core values as we live them to create a better country? And he started with truth. It's so funny. He responded mm -hmm. with, we have to tell people the truth and we have to share the truth and seek the truth. No accident that I wrote the one truth that's coming out now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm hoping that as he moves forward again, I'm not sure we'll agree on all of policy and all of the policies. You won't agree on everything with everyone, but I do love the fact that he is moving forward and talking about this from a truth standpoint. And I believe that He's someone who has fought for the truth his, his whole life, his whole career, following him and watching him as he cleaned up the rivers that he's cleaned up and cleaned up the Hudson and restored it and then had a huge impact with the Children Defense Fund. Again, trying to get to the truth of what's making our children sick. It's like he doesn't want to take one position or the other. He's fighting for kids and he's trying to help kids be healthy and trying to figure out what's making them sick and people attack him because he's trying to find and seek the truth. So I respect that a lot in him, that he's been this person who has sought the truth all these years. And if he's someone who's going to do that as, as president, I think that'd be wonderful. And I think we need every politician, every political leader leading this way from a standpoint of truth. How can you lead with a lie? Mm -hmm. How can you lead with lies and, and feel like you're making the world better? To me, yeah. that makes no sense whatsoever. And what I do think about is, as I wrote in the book, The One Truth, integrity yeah. comes from the word integer, which means whole and complete. Yeah. And so a leader with integrity, they're whole. They're complete. There's no gap in their character. There's no gap between what they say and what they do. They're living with the truth. People receive the truth and they're aligned in who they are, what they do, what they say. That's what I want. I want a leader who will live the truth, tell the truth, and have integrity. And again, I think people are fed up with the with the two choices we have all the time that are running. You know, honestly, I'd love to see DeSantis and RFK, mm -hmm. you know, run against each other because you will have two guys who have been fighting for the truth in a lot of ways. You may not agree again with all their policies, all their positions, mm -hmm. but I love the idea that both are trying to get to the bottom of the truth. Yeah, and let's face it, there's been a lot of lies and distortion, deception over the last few years playing out, you know, with what's going on in the world and the um the irony of of how science is is uh somehow become, you know, propaganda and a marketing machine as opposed to the actual pursuit of God and pursuit of truth. Yes, yeah, science is the search for truth. So it, it should always eventually lead you to the truth. And I always say, you know, God and science, by the way, should coexist beautifully because if science is a search for truth and God is truth, then eventually science should lead you to the creator and to God and what God is doing. And actually, the more you do seek, the more you do search, actually, it does lead you to so many truths, which is really cool. Like it, eventually, like there's all these thoughts that go, well, we actually thought we were right on that, but uh, we realized we were wrong this is the case. And we thought we were wrong here and actually realized this is the case. Yeah. And more and more, it's actually leading to the truth that is already out there, already written, already exists. I want to be super conscious of your voice. I want to be super conscious of the time. I do have a couple more questions, very quick ones. Um, uh, but I just encourage that we are never going to get to the depths of this book within a 15 minute conversation. I highly encourage anybody listening to go and check out the book 100% and go and listen to John's conversation with Ed Milet. That was an incredible one hour conversation. I listened to that in preparation. Like that was an incredible conversation, but um, 
I, I love this this uh, this overarching story that you play out with the Bible in terms of the garden and then with the the um, with Jesus and how you know in the early days of the garden there's this belief that I don't, that, that we need something outside of us. The serpent is calling, saying, "Just get something outside of you." And I think. I think there are so many modern day serpents that say, hey, go get energy in a drink. Go get like, you know, go get happiness in a meal. Go get beauty in a product. You know, it, it's we are being sold lies all of the time that we need stuff outside of us. And yet without being too much spoiler alert, the the ultimate truth that you reveal come the end is is Jesus, is to follow the character and the heart of jesus and and i guess as a as a fellow man of faith what does it mean to be a an obedient follower of jesus and, and why would anybody give their life to, to to jesus well i want to go back for a second i think it's important to understand you know why i even share that and why i even wrote that in the first place because mm -hmm. the garden represents the separation of man and women from god yeah. it's where it originated the disconnection and it's a story whether it's a story that actually happened, whether it's a story that's being told to us, whatever the case may be, it's a story that re represents the truth of separation. And it is the problem. Now think about that. That's an ancient Jewish story. That's not a Christian story. Mm -hmm. It's a Jewish story that was told thousands and thousands of years ago that is now in the Old Testament and in Genesis. And basically it's a story that represents what happens when we are separated from God and disconnected. And it's the force that was disconnecting us. And again, calling us to less, not more, but lying to us saying we would become more and when we actually become less. And it's the same thing that happens when we do a drug that we think will actually make us feel better. And that drug actually leads to temporary relief, but not restoration. And it leads to more separation. So anything you try to fill the void with, with, the separation you have besides God will lead you to a greater separation and a greater gap. So it represents that. Well, that was told thousands of years ago. Then there's the new Testament, which is Jesus, which basically represents the reconciliation and the oneness and the restoration back to God and with God. And so if the garden represents our separation, then the whole story of the new Testament is actually the prescription on how to get back to oneness. So I tell people in the book, I didn't write this to convince you that Jesus is the answer, that Jesus is the Messiah. I didn't write this to convince you anything. I grew up Jewish. I was someone who practiced Buddhism. I was a truth seeker. I wrote this because as I was searching for the truth and realizing that, that the separation is the major part of our story, then what's the story of oneness? Well, the only story ultimately of oneness is actually Jesus who takes our burden takes our sin, takes our pain, and allows us to become connected to the creator and become one with God. Corinthians 6, 17 says, he was joined to the Lord, is one spirit with him. So the goal is to be one spirit. Well, how do you do that? You have a spirit, God has a spirit. To become one spirit, Jesus is the uniter that brings the two spirits together. And that was his whole purpose. It's why he came. So both stories live inside of us, the separation story and the oneness story. And you can be any religion. You don't have to be even a Christian to believe and understand that Jesus came to bring about oneness and restoration. And the more you read the book and I take you through the logical understanding of that, it makes sense. Like for, for example, we heal in a loving relationship, right? We heal in a loving relationship. Well, I ask people all the time, no matter what religion they are, and some friends are atheists even, I'll say, do you have a hole in your soul? And everyone will say, yeah, I have a hole in my soul. Yes, H-O-L-A. Well, how do you become whole? W-H-O-L-A. How do I become one with God if I have this hole in my soul? And the thing is, you can't heal with a stranger. Like, you heal in a loving relationship. So if God is a stranger, then you can't heal in that relationship. It has to be a personal God. It has to be a God of love who loves you and forgives you. And forgiveness is where you take away the burden, the pain, and the sin. And so you take that away to now create oneness and restoration. I say sin and shame and guilt is like inflammation of the soul. So Jesus and love and forgiveness is what takes it away. It's the personal God. 
no other religion really talks about a personal God that loves you for you. In every religion, it's about you have to earn that trust. You have to earn that love. You have to be worthy of it and do something. Actually, you have to be do something to be worthy of it. So it's about doing, doing, doing. But Jesus is the only one that said, done. You don't have to do anything. I'm coming for you. I'm coming to take all your pain because I love you. And I'm going to take all of it for you so that you can be one with the father. Because I know the sin that separated you. And now I'm bringing you back to oneness. That to me is like something that is beautiful. That's not something to be afraid of. That's not something to say, oh, well, my family is of this religious belief and I can't do that. No, this is about, do you want healing? Do you want wholeness? Yes. This is the way that you find it and experience it is through love and forgiveness. And again, remember, God can't be a stranger. It has to be a personal God. And in all, in all these other religions, you really can't connect to God because he's not personal enough. But Jesus is the face of God that came here on earth to then allow us to experience that, to feel that, and then to be ultimately brought back into oneness through the Holy Spirit. Wow. And so, so his whole, his whole, the whole Christian faith is, I'm going to take your spirit, your pain, your burden. I'm going to replace it with, with mine. And in that oneness, you now live with more power, more peace, more joy, more love, more confidence, more courage. And by the way, you're not going to be a robot. It's not about you being like, you know, like you have to do everything I say you're going to do. You actually get yeah. to express your true self more authentically and more powerfully. You become more of who you are, not less. As my faith has grown, as I wrote this book, I'm becoming more of who I am, more nuances, more, more texture, more fabrics, more nuances that actually you see the, the uniqueness of who you are. And God wants you to, you to live a unique life, not a fearful life not a life of being conformed to the patterns of others, mm -hmm. but to be the expression of who he created you to be yeah. and be all that he made you to be. And in that oneness, you actually get to fully realize that. So wh whatever religion people are, I encourage them, just, just read the book. Just, just read the book. Give it a shot. Book one and book two, we don't even talk about any of that. It's only the short couple chapters in book three where I address that because I had to and I had to share how, how the oneness happens. But in those first two books, you're going to start nodding your head. You'll be, you'll be resonating with it. The truth will start speaking to you. And by the time book three comes, you go, okay, yeah, I think <laughs> you'll, you'll go, all right, I get this. This makes sense. And, yeah. and this guy's not trying to preach at me. He's not trying yeah. to convince me of anything. He's just trying to share an understanding and awareness. And guess what? Ask yourself at the end of the book, does it make you feel better? Right. Do you feel more whole? Do you feel like it's causing you to look in the right direction? And yeah. as it, as, as you, as you acknowledge that, then see where it takes you after that. Yeah. And then just decide to live with love instead of fear. And you start living with more love instead of fear. You'll yeah. start to feel more whole, more one, more connected. And, and I love it. And, and do you know what the one that, the thing that makes your testimony so endearing is that you're like, do you know what a previous me would have laughed a previous me would never have believed that I would have believed these things. And I'm the same. Like, I came to faith yeah. in the early thirties, much like you, when you accepted Jesus and like, there's, there's a, there's a version of me at the start of this podcast five years ago that would never have imagined that I'd be having conversations like this. Um, you know, so I think there's a God has a sense of humor. There's a sense of irony, but there's certainly something true that I found is that you can't deny the truth. Yes. You just, and just as you start to speak that truth and you read the truth, you can't deny it. That's what I say. As you read the book, try to refute it. Yeah. Refute what I'm talking about. And if you can, I'm open, like reach out to me. If you can yeah. refute it, tell me. And I, and I think the biggest barrier I had was that I didn't want to be told what to do. I didn't want right. to certainly didn't want to be obedient. Do you know what I mean? A, adaptive child, but I didn't want to be told I could do certain things. I didn't want to be told I couldn't do certain things, but I've realized that actually those words of wisdom are, are a playbook to create heaven on earth. I think that's the yeah. most accessible thing is it's a, just a, when you follow these things, if you do these things, you've got heaven on earth. If you do these things, you're probably, your life's going to feel like hell. You just nailed it. The whole book is about how do we bring heaven to earth and feel like we're living on, on living on heaven instead of earth and really making this world a better place and doing it with power, not with fear, doing it with the love, not hate. You're doing it with courage and confidence instead of anxiety, worry, worry and stress all the time. And so many people do feel like they're living in hell. And even many Christians still feel like they're living in hell, as I wrote in the book, because even though they may believe in Jesus, 
even though they may be been saved from a spiritual standpoint and their spirit has been saved, they have not allowed their soul to be healed. And the whole perfect, the whole perfect point of this book is to allow healing to take place. Like I want people to read this book and find healing and wholeness. And I think that's what we all want. We all know there's a hole. We all feel that emptiness. We all feel that gap. There are moments we feel despair. And I want people to feel whole. I want people to feel better. I want people to actually go through life recognizing their power that they have to not be a victim of this world, but to change this world and bring heaven to earth. And if people read this and do this, that's why I wrote it. Mm. My final question is that I have a word here at Always Betting yesterday. It's called heart print, which is the ripple effect, the legacy of our heart-centered interactions, the way that we love people, the possibilities that we create for people. I think you've just articulated that perfectly in a minute, just leading up to this. But is there anything you would add to that? If I use the word heart print, what do you hope that your heart print will be on people with the one truth? My hope is that, yeah, they'll read the book and they'll experience more love and they'll stop living with so much fear. They'll have so much more confidence and courage instead of anxiety, worry, and stress, and that they will recognize their power. I want people to recognize their power. That's why the second subtitle is unlock your power. I want them to elevate their mind, unlock their power, heal their soul. Because as you do this, you'll become who you're meant to be. And you'll feel so much more power, joy, and peace in this world. And that's how you're meant to live this world. Like we're not meant to live the other way. We're meant to live the way that I talk about in the one truth. So I want people to recognize that. And my, my heart print is that people will go forward in a different way, see the world through this lens, this unique and different lens. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. So it's going to change the way they think, the way they act. And then years from now, people are going to be talking about how this book was like that defining moment for them in their life allow them to see the truth, live the truth. And we know that the truth shall set you free and the truth will give you power in that freedom. John Gordon, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much for the all incredible work that you're putting out into the world and uh, rest up, rest that voice. You go again tomorrow. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate you. You're my last podcast of the day. And I thank you so much for, for allowing me to share. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you for making it to the end of the interview here on YouTube. I hope that our time spent together has left you a little bit better than before you push play. Before you go anywhere, please leave a comment down below. Some of your key reflections, your key takeaways. I love hearing from you and what this conversation has inspired in you. Let me know what you're going to do as a result of this conversation. I will be back next Wednesday where I will share another inspiring guest. To make sure that you don't miss that, please do subscribe hit the bell and you will be notified as soon as it goes live. If you're curious to know how I, through Always Better Than Yesterday, can serve you, your team, your organisation, please do visit alwaysbetterthanyesterday.com and it will be my honour and privilege to help you in any way I can. Keep leading, my friends. I've been Ryan Hartley, host of the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast here on YouTube. Always love.